Of course, that means that I won't be able to get down again, so I'll just keep talking. Um, so I'm talking about hot spots and mountains one, interactions between adaptive landscapes and the physical landscape. Um, where's the up? Oh, didn't work. Does this one? The second part of this talk is at 2.30 in room 516E in biogeography. So organismal diversity is generated and maintained on two landscapes. Um, topographic complexity of the geographic landscape can generate more species through a variety of mechanisms, including barriers to dispersal that promote speciation, or the environmental heterogeneity on topographically complex environments that can promote speciation accompanied by ecological divergence. Um, topographic complexity can also accommodate more species through a variety of mechanisms, including the barriers to dispersal that result in high turnover, accommodating more species within a given area, or environmental heterogeneity, resulting in high turnover of ecologically differentiated communities, accommodating more species in greater variety. So biotic interactions also matter to the maintenance of diversity. Species cannot persist where they cannot coexist with the other species within their range. And we might therefore expect assembly rules of communities to extend over a broader spatial scale. And this is a classic assembly rule that was rephrased in terms of quantitative traits. The range of functional trait values will increase directly with species richness to a maximum and then subsequently remain relatively constant. The relationship between the nearest neighbor trait distance and species richness will initially be relatively weak. And as community assembly proceeds, this relationship will strengthen and become more negative. That was formulated first for just simply directly translating classic assembly rules and then resulting from an eco-evolutionary model. So those trait values and their ranges and nearest neighbor distances are generated and maintained on this landscape. So the range of traits and the nearest neighbor distances among them are determined by the topography of the adaptive landscape. So here's our simplest model for how adaptive diversity, the diversity generated on the adaptive landscape, would be related to the geographic scaling on the geographic landscape. From the assembly rules, we would expect species richness to have a direct effect on the metrics, the trait range, and the nearest neighbor distance. But we can also add geographic range to that simple model because at least in the broadest study done, species richness is inversely related to geographic range size, which you could posit is a direct effect. And that geographic range size would have only indirect effects on the metrics of adaptive diversity via its impact on richness. But the relationships could be more complex. Geographic range size could have a direct effect on metrics of adaptive diversity if regional assemblages are structured by high turnover of small ranged ecologically differentiated species. So our model systems are three lineages Marmotines and heteromyids that occupy open habitats, which progressively expanded and experienced glacial cycling. So they fragmented, reconnected, relatively homogeneous forests at the upper elevations, driving non-adaptive radiations, especially of chipmunks. And if you've seen 20 or 30 chipmunks, you know why we say it's a non-adaptive radiation. <laughs> um, Callosiurines occupy tropical forests on both mountains and lowlands, and in areas that remain forested since the Miocene climactic optimum. So our data are for the analysis of adaptation, our jaw shape and size, 
and the species we measured here relative to the total and the lineage. So we analyzed 59 of the 63 heteromyidae, 61 of the 66 marmotony, and a poor sample, only 43 of the 66 callosiurnae. They're not as well represented in museum collections. I mean, look, this shows the landmarks and the semi-landmarks, Procrustes superimposed, with semi-landmark split to minimize bending energy, and size is measured as centroid size, which is highly correlated with body size. So the phylogenies, the Menendez phylogeny for squirrels, Callosiurnae and Marmotony are squirrels. And for Heteromyidae, we downloaded a thousand of the source trees from Upham's Inferring the Mammal Tree, and calculated maximum clade credibility tree. From modeling shifts in adaptive regimes, we fit models derived from ecology to shape and size using the MMV morph package for fitting data, evolutionary models to multivariate data. Because we couldn't assume that we actually knew how many from ecology, or we knew enough ecology or could predict from ecology, we also investigated models obtained by the automatic shift detection procedure in phylogenetic EM. We compared the best fitting models as judged by the AICC by parametric bootstrapping. Our geographic data are the geographic ranges obtained from the IUCN red list, which were projected to equal areas using the projection appropriate for the continent. And these were resolved into grid cells of 25 kilometers per site. So our metrics of adaptive diversity for each grid cell we calculated the range of size and shape as the difference between the two extreme values, calculated the mean nearest neighbor distance of size and shape as the average distance between each species and the one most similar to it. And these analyses were done in EPM, uh, EcoPhyloMapper, an R package for integrating phylogenetic, morphological, and geographic data. <clears throat> Our geographic metrics are species richness and mean geographic range size. So th this is the average of the geographic ranges of the species within each cell. So when these are low, on average, all the species are small ranged. Obviously, having very wide ranged ones within the cell will elevate above that. So the smallest ones are typically small range species. So from modeling the relationships among richness, range size, and metrics, we first fit multiple regression models, predicting the metrics of adaptive diversity as a function of species richness and geographic range size using spatial autoregressive models. Then we use those regressions in piecewise structural equation models, which can take SAR models, so the uh, adjustment for spatial autocorrelation is retained in the structural equation models. So these are our best fitting models of adaptive regimes of shape. As you will see, the largest difference between any of them is a single regime. Despite the similar number of regimes, the lineages differ considerably in shape disparity. Heteromyidae is the most disparate, uh, Marmotony, the least. Callosiurinae is intermediate, but one species, you can see it's an outlier on two, it's actually an outlier on like three PCs, contributes 22% of the total disparity. That's a colonial insect eating squirrel. And five, which include miniatures, account for 50% of the total. Now, as expected, species richness is inversely related and usually strongly related to geographic range size. So here are our metrics per grid cell. Um, and these are not on a common scale because I want you to see within the continents more right now than across them. So you see how where the size ranges are high and the size nearest neighbor distances are low. And they're not always perfectly matched. And so these are the results from the structural equation models for the size range and the size nearest neighbor distance. You will note Marmotny looks weird. 
For the shape metrics, we can see the shape range and the shape nearest neighbor distance. Again, those are not perfectly matched, and the very, very dark red in Southeast Asia is where that anteating squirrel is. For the shape metrics, um, we see basically the same patterns. And again, marmotony is weird. Callosiurony is because that one specialist really dominates all the patterns. So in summary, this simple model fits a single case, the shape nearest neighbor distance of callosiurony. An unexpected model fits all four of the metrics for marmotony. Geographic range and richness, and richness directly affect the metrics, but geographic range size has no direct effect on richness, although in the SAR model it clearly did. The complex model fits the other seven cases, although geographic range has a very slight effect in two of them. So in conclusions, species richness has the strongest, most predictable effect on the metrics of adaptive diversity. Assembly rules do apply at a larger spatial scale than community. Geographic range size is predictably related to species richness and usually to metrics of adaptive diversity. The hotspots of adaptive diversity are regions of high turnover of small range species and ecologically differentiated communities. And if you want to know why Marmotany is so different, Go to hotspots and mountains, too, combining landscape complexity and connectivity. So acknowledgments. I'd like to thank Paul Avian for resurrecting our computers <laughs> in time to finish the analyses before the meeting started. And we thank the curators and collection managers for access to specimens. And we thank everyone who develops our packages. Thank you. <laughs> That's me. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm Tiago Quento. I'm coming from the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. And before I start, I should acknowledge my collaborators, in, in particular, Rodolfo, who is a grad student who actually did the, most of the work and couldn't be here, and also Lucas Porto, who is a postdoc. And we also talk about similar stuff, so if, you get, if you're interested, he'll be talking the last day of the conference. And also, before I get started, I just want to acknowledge a bunch of people, um, in particular, most of people in my lab. A lot of people who have helped and discussed some of the ideas here, like Blair, Wackenberg, Paulo Guimarães, Daniel Silvestro, Matia Pires, everyone who has contributed data to the Paleobiology database and the NAU database, and FAPESP in my university for funding. So I would like to start asking the question, how do we infer the relevance of species interaction in diversification dynamics? It might be supposedly easier to do that in ecology and extent time, but how we do that at deep time? So people have done that in different ways. For example, this is an example of biologists using molecular phylogenies in the competitive methods, in particular trait-dependent diversification models where you can actually score species according to different kinds of ecologies or species interactions and see and test if they are any potential relationship between a given kind of interaction and extinction or speciation regimes. Paleontologists have done that slightly differently, mostly looking for time series that either describe speciation or extinction rates. In this particular example here, trying to see if there is a, an association between the dynamics of a given clade and a potential competitor clade to see if extinction allows for, for example, speciation of the competitor clade. Uh, both paleontologists and biologists have looked into this question, in particular thinking about interspecific competition, trying to find evidence for diversity-dependent diversification, either speciation or extinction. And that's where <clears throat> some of the work we have done in my lab uh, um, touches this, this subject. And we have several studies now that have found evidence for diversity dependence within clades and between clades that are potentially competitors. But most of the microevolutionary studies that have been done so far, including our own, uh, usually do not explicitly consider spatial overlap between species. Of course, we haven't been absolutely naive about that. In this example here, we have 
carved the dynamics in different portions of the world. So we're not looking for a global diversity dynamics, but a dynamics at least at the regional scale, which is better than actually doing nothing. Um, but I guess we can perhaps do a little bit better than that. And we have also not taken into account, at least not explicitly, um, ecological overlap or ecological similarity among species when we're trying to infer the role of species interactions in driving, potentially driving speciation or extinction dynamics. <clears throat> so the goal of this work was to first develop a new approach to more explicitly evaluate the effect of competition on speciation and extinction dynamics, and then apply this approach to the fossil record of Canids in North America to try to see how relevant is, if it is at all, uh, the potential for interspecific competition in driving speciation and extinction dynamics. So we got our data from the paleobiology database, <clears throat> um, and then we, this, is, this was the goal, to try to build a metric, a time series to be more explicit, that took into account temporal overlap, spatial overlap, and morphological similarity as a proxy for ecology. So how do we do that? Temporal coexistence, it's fairly easy, not easy, um, in the fossil record, because the fossil record, as some of you know, is incomplete. But we can estimate times of origin, times of extinction of species, and then go in different points in time and see which species were alive at that point in time. With that, get some sort of, <clears throat> get an estimate of who, whose species is overlapping in time with another species. Spatial coexistence is very tricky in the fossil record, so we tried different things to, here. So because fossil occurrences, luckily for us, have information on latitude and longitude, so we can actually place in space some of those species. Um, but the fossil record is very incomplete in space, more so than in time. So we try to <clears throat> use different approaches. I'm not gonna go into detail of each one of those. I'm just gonna mention very briefly. So there is the, I'm calling here the regional approach, which is basically if a species exists in North America, it is gonna influence, or we assume it's gonna influence another species in North America. And the other side of the spectrum is the site approach, which was only considered two species to coexist in space if they were found in the same fossil site locality, which is very demanding of the data. So these are two very um, <clears throat> opposite approaches. And the REACH approach is kind of also regional site. The regional approach, I'm not gonna go into detail, uh, <clears throat> but basically we are looking for the distance that species could travel uh, within a given time interval and using that information to see if two species were not too far away, perhaps they could coexist. And they, they had lack of observation of coexistence because the fossil record is incomplete. I mean, the idea here is to try to use different, uh, different sorts of spatial metrics to see if our results are robust yeah, <clears throat> to that uh, inference. Ecological overlap was basically done using morphology, <clears throat> and that's mostly due to the great work that some people have done, so including some people in this, in this room, um, um, <clears throat> on characterizing uh, the ecology, mostly food uh, ecology, of, of those carnivores based on tooth morphology <clears throat> and also body size as well. So the idea is that you have a two-dimensional morphospace where you have in the x-axis body mass and the y-axis an index of carnivory which can go from hypercarnivore, which mostly includes vertebrates in their diet, to sort of hypocarnivores, which include very little or much less um, <coughs> um, vertebrates in their diet. And from that morphospace, each dot here is a species. So we can actually calculate the distance of two species and assume that if two species are close by in this morphospace, they have similar ecologies. If they are far away, they have more different <coughs> ecologies. So we used two metrics, the mean pairwise distance among species, and as was mentioned in the previous talk, the mean nearest neighbor distance among two species. So it's only taking into account the closest species to the focal species. <clears throat> so with that, we combine that. So for so species to be considered to be a potential competitor it has to overlap in space, in time, and then we can measure the ecological distance or the morphological distance to be more precise. So what is our expectation is that as the distance increases, the intensity of competition should decrease. That's a big assumption. It's a proxy here. We're just doing that to see how it, how it works. <clears throat> and that I'm not going to go into detail, but then we used a framework, a Bayesian framework implemented in the, in the software Pyrate, 
to jointly estimate the preservation rate, the times of speciation, the times of extinction of all those species, to take into account, to explicitly take into account uh, the incompleteness of the fossil record. And then we are looking for this parameter here, which is, describes a potential correlation or potential association between a given time series shown here, I'm not sure if I have a pointer, I don't know. Oh, yeah. shown here by this parameter. So this is gonna be number of species varying through time or the metric that measures competition through time. And if this is zero, there's no association. If this is a number, it could be a positive or negative. It would describe what is the relationship between a change in the time series and the change in speciation rate. So what are the expectations? So here's classic diversity dependence. As you increase diversity, you should expect speciation to decrease and extinction to rise. That's the, the diversity dependence theory prediction. So our parameter for speciation should be negative and our parameter for extinction should be positive. In the case of <clears throat> our um, competition metric or to be more precise, the pairwise distance among species, we expect the opposite pattern. As the distance increase, species are more further apart, less likely to compete, so speciation could be higher. Uh, and as, on the other hand, if, if the distance decreases, species are more likely to be similar, and then competition should be stronger, and perhaps uh, speciation smaller, and the extinction on the, other, on the opposite direction. So we have an expectation for <clears throat> the parameter to be positive for speciation and negative for extinction. <laughs> we also did this, I think this was a, um, <clears throat> some, some work have been doing this now, but it's kind of an interesting novelty that instead of looking, whoa, instead of looking into, <laughs> I guess the novelty word just the, uh, um, <laughs> so instead of looking at the whole dynamics, we broke the dynamics in different time windows to try to capture, for example, what's happening during the radiation phase, what's happening during the decline phase, and so on. <clears throat> so some results here. So this is just net diversification, speciation minus extinction. So as you would expect from this graph here where there's a rise in species, um, we see a positive net diversification at the beginning. It goes close to zero, sometimes slightly negative, and then towards the end, more negative. And that has been driven by changes in speciation and extinction. So that's the raw description of the, <coughs> of the dynamics here. Here are the metrics uh, of diversity through time using the different uh, spatial uh, scales. So at the regional scales on the left and the site scale on the right, and you can see that the reach and the regional are very, very similar. Perhaps we were too um, uh, less conservative the reach, but uh, the site has some similarities and some differences as well to the, to the pattern of uh, regional diversity. So the site here is measuring what's the average number of species that a given species encounters through its life. It's not that it's not the diversity of, of specific communities or sites or assemblages. The average number of species of a species encounters through its life. And what we can see here, we're looking now at the, at the posterior distribution of the speciation correlation parameter, is that there is evidence for diversity dependence in the speciation only in the rise phase, which makes sense. As species are being accumulated in the rise phase, uh, as more species are added to the system, speciation drops. And that, and that association disappears later on, as one would expect, because the clade is actually going into decline. <clears throat> if the world was fully dominated by diversity dependence, we would expect the clade to, <clears throat> which is not the case, but the clade to, to reach an equilibrium state. And what's interesting here is that we see the same pattern irrespective of the different kind of metric, spatial metric we use. So there's diversity dependence through speciation during the expansion phase only. We see no evidence for diversity dependence to act through extinction dynamics. So an addition of species doesn't necessarily increase the extinction uh, probability. <clears throat> Um, fortunately, I'm not going to be able to show because we are reanalyzing the data for the, I guess, the most interesting part, I guess, but we are analyzing the data. But I can tell you uh, from preliminary analysis that the same pattern we recover in the radiation phase, we recover with distance. So the competition seems to be relevant when we measure that not only through diversity dependence, but when we measure through the distance among species only in the radiation phase and only through speciation dynamics, not through extinction dynamics as well. 
So <clears throat> the summary here is we propose a new approach that more directly measure the effect, the effect of interspecific competition, and that can be applied to any given group that you have. If you have data on, on, on spatial distribution, temporal times of origination, times of extinction, I guess I'm going to wrap up. Uh, you can apply this. You don't need to use pirate. You just can construct your own time, time series measurement and then use that with your perf preferred um, <clears throat> statistical approach. So diversity dependence in speciation is, is recovered at all spatial scales, but only during the radiation phase. Um, diversity dependence in extinction is absent here. So it seems that diversity doesn't affect the extinction dynamics, <clears throat> or I should say the diversity of candidates does not affect the extinction dynamics of candidates. <laughs> and the future analysis we will <coughs> more properly evaluate the dynamics using the competition metrics, which I mentioned here, and this is we propose. And for those of you who are interested, we actually have um, bioarchive. I didn't present the results. Here we have all the results. I didn't present the results for time's sake and because we're reanalyzing um, the metrics, but I think the results are gonna be the same. So if you're interested in the general approach, here's the, the B archive. And with that, I would like to finish to acknowledge again uh, everyone in the lab, a bunch of people who have contributed to discussions throughout this funding, people who have added um, data to the Paleobiology database and the PBDB, and I do think I have one or two minutes for questions. Thank you, for, thank you for that, that was really great. I was just curious, in the raw data, it looked like you started to see, near the end of the Pleistocene, a potential increase in competition, and do you see anything, but it doesn't look like that pl uh, plays out, um, so in the, yeah, the raw data. Yeah, so the very end of the, of the, of the dynamics, there's a rise in extinction, which makes the net diversification goes uh, negative. Um, we don't really know what's going on there. And, and from our results, it doesn't seem to be the diversity of candidates is not driving that rise in extinction. We, okay, I guess it's, <laughs> I could go forever, but uh, we can chat more later. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. So, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, today I'm gonna talk uh, about differences in the strength of selection in terrestrial and aquatic mammals. So since the region of tetrapods, several lineages secondarily adapted to aquatic lifestyle, and repeated times, they acquire very similar uh, adaptations to this new ecology. And mammals are no exception. Uh, they exhibit uh, several different adaptations. So for example, and I don't know if I can, Okay, uh, so for example, uh, okay, so web feet, water repellent fur, uh, handling reduction, flippers, dorsal nars, uh, higher lung capacity for diving, etc. And obviously, the evolutionary signature of this phenotypic diversity seen in mammals can be detectable at the molecular level as well. Uh, in this context, Omega, or selective strength, or uh, strength of selection, is the ratio uh, between non-synonymous and synonymous substitutions, and it measures not only the strength, but also the mode of natural selection. So if omega is one, then the whole coding sequence evolves neutrally. If it's uh, lower than one, it's under constraint, so negative selection, selection. And if it's higher than one, it's under positive selection. Uh, a great and well and very well ex uh, study example of reduced uh, selective pressure, so less purifying selection, is the lack of smellability in aquatic mammals. So they have lost their uh, olfactory organs and also have less olfactory receptors. Here's a uh, showing example of how whales uh, progressively lost their uh, olfactory ability through time. Uh, in this study, uh, we wanted to know if aquatic transitions are linked to changes in selection regimes in other genes 
od uh, other than uh, olfactory ones or sensory related ones. And if these changes are limited to fully aquatic mammals or not, because often uh, previous studies only consider uh, fully aquatic forms. For this, uh, we use it a, se a set of alignments of mammalian orthologous genes, and we investigate these differences in selective strength, omega, uh, among terrestrial, semi, and fully aquatic mammals in a Bayesian framework. And just to explain a little bit how it works, so we infer a uh, species-specific omega using node omega from the software base code. And if you guys are interested, you can check uh, on GitHub or direct, directly on Latril uh, and colleagues 2021. Uh, the method requires a species tree and also an, a DNA alignment, uh, plus uh, optionally some life history traits on the species included in the uh, species tree. The method assumes that uh, omega mutation rate and these life history traits included uh, vary along the branches of the phylogenetic tree as a Brownian process. And uh, as a result, it estimates a variance-covariance matrix between omega and these life history traits in, and also uh, estimate ancestral states for the traits. Uh, so, specifically about the data we use it in this, uh, in this study, we selected 1,000 coding orthologs genes. They have varied functions. Plus, we also selected 29 olfactory receptors, and we use it then as a control group, because as I said before, they, well, they are well studied, and we have an expectation for them. Uh, they, we expected them to be under weaker purifying selection in uh, aquatic mammals. Uh, as life history traits, we included uh, aquatic adaptation, and I'm going to talk about this in the next slide, uh, but we also account for body size because it's a fundamental trait for organisms in general, uh, and it can be a proxy for different uh, physiological and ecological traits as well. And we also account for effective population size. Uh, uh, as I said before, the program always estimates uh, evolution of life history traits and uh, per lineage strains of selection or omega. omega. So we account for uh, aquatic adaptation as a gradient, classifying species in one of four categories uh, based mainly on morphological and behavioral traits. Terrestrials are species that don't have any adaptation for aquatic lifestyle, so zebras, giraffes, gorilla, etc. Uh, we have two categories for semi-aquatic groups. One are species that have adaptations for uh, aquatic lifestyle, but, but they still spend most, most of their, time, the, their lives on land. Uh, so, for example, beavers, platypus. The second semi-aquatic group are uh, the second semi-aquatic group encompasses species that rely more on aquatic environments, and their adaptation limited uh, their locomotion on land. So, seals, burrows, uh, sea lions, etc. And the last one is fully aquatic ones; they don't leave water. So whales, manatees, dugongs, dolphins, etc. Uh, when base code estimates a covariancy and a posterior probability between uh, aquatic transition or aquatic adaptation and changes in per lineage omega, it can give us three outcomes. So a negative correlation, uh, negative correlation between these two variables, no correlation at all, or positive correlation. Uh, in the negative correlation scenario, terrestrial group, we expect the terrestrial groups to present weaker purifying selection, uh, whereas fully aquatic ones uh, would present stronger purifying selection. And the covariance and posterior probability uh, between, between these two variables would look something like that. And I'm sorry because I did this on PowerPoint, so it's not perfectly. Uh, the covariance will be shifted to the negative side, as you can see. Uh, zero, 
and the posterior probability distribution between these two variables uh, would be asymmetric with most values uh, close to zero. Uh, the opposite would happen to the, on the positive correlation scenario. So terrestrial lineages would exhibit uh, stronger purifying selection uh, compared to aquatic ones with uh, weaker purifying selection. And the covariance, dis the covariance distribution would be shifted to the positive shot side this, uh, this time, in this case. And the posterior probability distribution would have more values close to well. I don't know what happened to my graphs. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but anyways, <laughs> uh, we found like a positive correlation uh, scenario basic and should be nicely like draw more or less how I presented before. But anyways, uh, <laughs> we found correlation, uh, positive correlation in 20.3% of this uh, varied function genes, which is, we cannot see in the graph, but uh, believe me, it's true. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and for the olfactory genes, we, find, we found the same, uh, the same pattern in more than half of them, so in 53% of them. Uh, when you look, and we look at uh, median species-specific omega across these 1,000 varied function genes, we see the same pattern. We didn't see before, but anyways, uh, we see the same pattern of uh, post-correlation and a consistent trend in weaker, of weaker purifying selection as the species enter aquatic environments. So specifically, uh, we found that omega is on average 36% higher in fully aquatic uh, forms compared to terrestrial ones here, and 22% higher in semi-aquatic, the ones that rely more on aquatic environments compared to uh, terrestrial ones. Uh, and as I said before, these differences are not driven only by uh, fully aquatic forms. And then we see, like, we see this uh, trend uh, instead of just being driven by the whales, for example. Uh, when you look at per species values, instead of median across uh, all genes, and here I lump together all three aquatic categories in this orange, uh, uh, distribution here. Um, we see uh, some values of omega very close to one in aquatic lineages. Uh, and this could potentially indicate that at least for a few genes uh, would be on their way to, loss, uh, to lose their function and become pseudogenes. Uh, and some previous studies showed that uh, gene loss is related to aquatic lifestyle. Uh, aside from no factory receptors or sensory-related genes. So just some take-home messages. We found this consistent pattern of weaker purifying selection as species enter aquatic environments. And this gradient of adaptations, uh, aquatic transitions, are linked to consistent changes, not only in phenotypes, but also in evolutionary dynamics uh, in at least some genes. So thank you very much. And sorry about the graphs. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Maybe UV light, they were less exposed, I would say that, yeah. Is that what that's, that's what you're thinking? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I also found like, e we are not specifically uh, trying to see like each gene because we ju it's just a selection of them. Uh, but in these genes, very close to one, I, take, I took a look at them and they are, a few of them I remember was like transmembranic proteins. I don't know if it's like, uh, I don't know specific about something or it's just like, well, because it's not representative of the whole thing. Like, but anyways. <laughs> Have you computed um, uh, estimating omega on the gene trees instead of the species tree itself? Mm -hmm. Have you haven't done that analysis? 
uh, yeah, it's a gene tree, I think. Yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, so you're using the phylogeny of species? And of gene tree, sorry. I, I said species, but I, yeah, gene tree. Yeah, okay, yeah. so you're doing it on the gene trees themselves? Yes. Okay, yeah. cool. And, uh, oh, and does that model consider multinucleotide mutations? The fact that mutations often happen uh, on two sites next to each other? I'm not sure. The codon model you're using? Yeah, because if you uh, incorporate multinucleotide mm -hmm. mutations, you get like, way different omega estimates. Okay. I'm not sure if that package is doing mm -hmm. that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good morning, everyone. My name is Natalia Caldera. I work at the Laboratory of Microevolution and Macroecology at the University of Sao Paulo with Thiago Quintal, who just presented, and Lucas Porto. And today I invite you to assess the correlation between speciation and extinction rates with me and revisit and refine the third law of paleobiology. Hopefully, I'll give you a brief introduction of this topic. I'll show you how we obtain the speciation and extinction rates. I'll show you why and how we divided the diversification dynamics of carnivorous mammals into time windows. I'll show you our correlation so far, and I'll give you a brief conclusion of this topic of what we did until now. So in 1990, Stanley noted that speciation extinction rates, average rates of speciation extinction, appear to be correlated when considering several clades at the same time during the entire diversification dynamic. In 1994, Gilensky tested that for 163 living and extinct orders of mammal, of marine animals, as you can see on the right uh, graph. This pattern has been noted in the literature throughout all this time. And in 2017, Charles Marshall published that paper, Five Paleobiological Laws Needed to Understand the Evolution of the Living Biota. And he considered this pattern as the third paleobiological law, the one that I talked about in the title. He also notes about this law that for most of their histories, for most of the clades' histories, there has been almost as much extinction as origination. But why are average rates of speciation extinction correlated throughout the diversification dynamics? We see, we can imagine, for example, a species, and if a species has high, a high degree of specialization, then we expect the species to subset, because this specialization creates subsets, correct? we are going to see different, different groups of the same species. They can be populations or they can be subsets within populations. That can uh, bring us, uh, that can favor speciation when the, subset, um, when the subset isolates the gene pool within the population. But it also favors extinction. When the species speciates into other two, then we have two, speci two new species with smaller populations, which favors extinction. The opposite can happen if the dispersal capacity is high, because then it homogenizes the, the species throughout its geographical distribution, and the opposite happens. The gene pool is homogenized, we have lower speciation and probably lower extinction. That brings us to think that speciation and extinction operate under the same mechanisms. Those are two examples of mechanisms. There are more, but of course I have constraint time, so I showed you those two. However, if a clade is already extinct, then mathematically it is necessary for the number of origination extinction events to be the same. A second, however, I want to add is that this correlation has only been considered for the entire history of the clades, as I have been noting until now, and I'm going to show you later on that one diversification can have, and sometimes it does, different phases. Another, however, is that most studies were performed on super-specific levels. I showed you uh, a study on orders. And we don't know if that's a good proxy for, for what happens at the species level. So as Led Zeppelin would say, it makes me wonder whether speciation extinction rates remain correlated throughout the diversification dynamics of carnivorous mammals when we analyzed different stages of the diversification dynamic, 
And if that happens, in which of those phases are the speciation extinction rates more strongly correlated? Another thing that I wonder is, does this correlation still exist when the analysis is performed at the species level? In order to assess those two questions, we compiled a database using paleobiology database and now new and old worlds, which is a database comprised only of mammals. And after accounting for taxonomic, taxonomic uncertainty, and um, we also excluded families that had less than four occurrences per lineage. And what I'm, when I say lineage, I'm not saying the entire family. It is one family on one location. For example, I don't know if you can see the pointer. We have Felidae in North America. And we also have a cat somewhere here in Eurasia. <laughs> somewhere here in Eurasia. Uh, those are two different lineages. So we are only using those that have more than four occurrences which uh, gives us a database with 22 lineages, 12 in Eurasia, 10 in North America, and 9,959 occurrences. Then we applied that those occurrences, we put them through PIRED, which estimates, among other things, speciation, extinction, and net diversification rates. What I'm showing you is a PIRED uh, PIRAT result. In order to divide the the, the diversification dynamics into time windows, we use net diversification rates. But why do we need to divide it into time windows? I showed you this, this example on the last slide. And as you can see, for this group and for many other groups, it appears that the diversification dynamic has three phases. The first one is expansion, which you can see on your far left uh, uh, blue square in which the net diversification, the average net diversification, is positive. The species are being added into the clade. Then we have decline, far right, in which the species are being removed from the clade. There's a lot of, there's something happening, and the species are being removed. The net diversification dynamic is below zero. And then there's another, another, another time window, another moment, which I'm calling equilibrium, this, the middle one, the orange one, uh, in which diversification, the net diversification rate is zero or close enough to zero for the species number to be, to be stabilized. We expect speciation extinction to be correlated among the clades during equilibrium, but we are not sure what happens during expansion and decline, and this is what we're going to assess. The way we found our time windows was by doing a simple function on R. Uh, this function, in this function, the user sets a cut, which is a number that will be multiplied by the maximum and minimum net diversification rate. For example, this is a putative dynamic. I made this on PowerPoint as well, Bruna. Um, and this cut, I used 0.5 here. And in this, for this uh, putative clade, we have the maximum net diversification is one the minimum is minus 0 0.8. So 0 0.5 times one is 0 0.5. 0 0.5 times minus 0 0.8 is minus 0 0.4. I don't know why the minuses are not showing there, sorry. So everything between those two numbers, 0 0.5 and minus 0 0.4, is considered equilibrium. What's before 0 0.5 is expansion, after minus 0 0.4 is decline. This is an example of the, the output uh, we have on the function so far. I'm working on making these graphs better looking, but this is, this is what we're showing so far. Blue bars are expansion, uh, yellow bars are equilibrium, red or pink bars are decline, and here we have two lineages, and physiology in Eurasia and North America. So after we did that, we calculated the average speciation and extinction dynamics within each time window for each lineage, and we correlated, this is, these are spearmint correlations. Um, we first correlated, correlated them by status, extant or, or extinct. As you can see on, there's Gilinski's result on your left and my result on your right. And the extant lineages are on, in green, the extinct lineages are in, in pink. We recovered that correlation that Gilinski saw. So apparently for our data as well, extinct uh, lineages 
are more correlated, the speciation and extinction rates are more correlated for extinct lineages, but the extant lineages also present the same pattern, oh my god. And uh, <laughs> what I'm showing here is that, like I said, the correlation is stronger for extinct lineages, and it means that, that Galinsky's and my result being similar, it means that the, the specific level I'm working on is, is, is recovering the same, the same pattern as well. It doesn't appear to be that much further. We also applied that uh, with windows, of course. And when we analyze with windows, we see for the equilibrium, both extant and extinct lineages are very correlated, as we expected. But for expansion and decline, there's, there is a significant correlation only for extinct lineages, as we also expected. We also did this, uh, performed the same uh, Spearman regression for location uh, as a proxy. I'm sorry that the legend is not printed in this graphic, but I'll show you what they are. Salmon is Eurasian or Eurasian uh, lineages. In teal, you see North American lineages. The circles are extant lineages and squares are extinct lineages. And we also recover uh, the, the Gilinskis, Gilinskis correlation here, uh, especially it's, it's, it's significant for Eurasian, Eurasian lineages. When we apply that to windows, we also find that it, during equilibrium you have, um, we have a strong correlation for both of them. We have no correlation during the expansion and no correlation in Eurasia during the decline, only in North America. We're trying to figure out what that means. So the take home messages I want you to, to take home are that the speciation and extinction rates appear to be correlated, correlated to the diversification history of carnivora. However, this correlation is absent during the expansion of diversity and is weaker during the decline, both for status analysis and for for locality analysis, which means that we might need to revisit that idea that the same mechanisms affect speciation and extinction during the entire diversification dynamics of carnivorous mammals. I would like to thank you all for the attention, my beautiful and insightful lab for all their insights, and also Charles Marshall for his insights as well. Thank you. I think it's transition time already, but is, is it? I'm not seeing the time. Ex sorry. Yeah, I have one minute. Yeah. yeah. Okay. If anyone has, yes. Do paleontologists um, consider the patency model for uh, diversification such that it's the area that drives both speciation and extinction? And you didn't put that up. You said there were other processes. Sure. But do do you? Okay, I'm sorry, but when they closed the door, I couldn't hear what you said. So can you just repeat the first part of your question? Just the first part. Like the name of the model. I didn't hear it. Yeah. it some people refer to it as the patency model, such that there's something about the area and the time that drives speciation and extinction simultaneously. Not something about the lineage, but about the place. Right. I am not sure if Tiago and Lucas have, have some insight to give me. Not More specific than that, then in, at times in areas with a lot of geological activity, oh, yes, yes, you would yes, get yes. both processes occurring, but it wouldn't be lineage, it wouldn't be due to the trait of the lineage, but mm. the trait yes. of the place. And Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. yes. Yeah. Thank you, thank you for doing so. Yeah. So people have, have looked into that, right? tectonics as a, as a predictor for, for speciation. And we right. find it. Yeah. I think now it's time for, for transition. <laughs> so. Okay, thank you all so much for sticking it out to the end of the session. I will try my best to finish on time. I will warn you, uh, I can, I have been known to go over. So I, I'm on my best behavior, I promise. 
Um, okay, so today I'm going to talk to you about a paper that um, really I, my role on this paper is just more of the puppeteer. Um, I, I want to start off by highlighting um, that the vast majority of the work has been done by my co-authors, specifically my postdoc, George Brooks, um, and Yosef, who's in the room. I think you all probably know Yosef. Um, they're the ones that really have gotten this thing to take flight. And um, they've been assisted by uh, our students, Nick, who's also in the room, Haley, who couldn't be here today. They're responsible for making sure the analyses actually got done, all the data were collected, everything lined up. And then finally, Chris Mull, who, who's a collaborator and former postdoc, who's our shark specialist. He's worked extensively on the shark phylogeny and on their traits. So again, all credit to them. This work was funded dur uh, by my startup uh, at Virginia Tech, and um, so that's my acknowledgement. And we also did this mostly over Zoom during 2020 and 2021. Okay, yeah, just in case I run out of time, I'm probably gonna fly through the methods and possibly the results. So um, you can find a draft of this project on uh, BioArchive, it's in, it's second round of revision, so it might be out someday soon, I hope. Um, and yeah, so stay tuned for that. Oh, okay. <laughs> right, so our trait phenotypes, it's obviously supposed to just be on one line. Our trait phenotypes are, are uh, we think of them as evolving, you know, in sort of a scaffold of genetic variation and developmental constraints. And maybe we're thinking about selection from abiotic factors and biotic factors that are influencing the, um, the phenotype that we measure. Okay, so th this may be something about the environment that's an abiotic factor we measure and something ecological um, such as the prey base, predator-prey interactions, or competition as we've seen in this session so far. So, for ease, I'm just going to ignore all of that interesting genetic variation that we see when we see trait evolution, and I'm also going to ignore ecological interactions, because those are hard things. What is easy is to measure attributes of the environment, and I mean really simple attributes, and, and it's often easy to construe something about development. So, for example, we might say we're studying a trait such as body size in an environment such as the aquatic environment, and we might say there's something about development, like uh, these eggs are fertilized in the water column. Or I study life history evolution, so we might drill down and say something about, oh, size and metamorphosis, how does that vary among aquatic organisms with external fertilization? So this is really a microevolutionary mindset that I have usually most of the time, and we sort of accept that these constraints of sort of the environment or development are kind of fixed. When we cross the chasm over into thinking over macroevolutionary timescales, constraints are no longer necessarily as obvious or things are potentially much more flexible. So here's a really well-known example of evolution of body size over evolutionary time. We've seen body size is steadily increasing and it really increases when you get a key innovation such as multicellularity and maybe something about the environment changes like there's more oxygen around. That's when we see body size really start to take off. So there are constraints, but they're much less important. So to tell you the story of this project, I study life history trait evolution in fishes, including chondrichthyans, sharks, and rays. And I was interested sort of in how do life histories change when you evolve live bearing out of egg laying uh, ancestors. My postdoc, George, joined the lab. He had worked on very similar questions in snakes. We all know snakes are a great model for the evolution of viviparity. And he also was interested in thinking about not only viviparity, but transitions between terrestrial and aquatic habitats. Of course, we're simple minded. We're like, oh, sea snakes are viviparous. That must be an interesting question. Let's study that. So we wondered specifically, why do you evolve live birth? And okay, the answer, I'll just tell you right now, there's a lot of reasons it's often advantageous to evolve live birth. There are many reasons, and that's not what we're talking about today. Why not evolve live birth actually turned out to be really interesting to me because it turns out 
a prerequisite for evolving live birth is internal fertilization. All sharks and, and rays and all squamates, in fact, all amniotes, have internal fertilization. So they do not have to worry about fertilization uh, when they're evolving live birth. That's not true of bony fishes and amphibians. So you see transitions in both fertilization mode and viviparity in these two groups, which is super interesting and largely missing from the conversation on the evolution of viviparity because all of that work has mostly been done in chondrichthians and reptiles, which already have internal fertilization. All right, so that's, that's tangent. Okay, so how, now we ask, how does the evolution of viviparity affect other life history traits? The traits I am interested in, body size, age and maturity, clutch size, things like that. And finally, do these life histories evolving in concert differ, you know, when you see transitions among aquatic and terrestrial environments? Okay, so we know, I know, life history traits evolve in response to external mortality rates. Okay, so it's very well understood from studies of guppies, from studies from fisheries. If you increase uh, natural mortality, you're going to get earlier agent maturation. This means agent maturation is a proxy, an inverse proxy for adult mortality. Lifetime fecundity, by the same token, can be a proxy for juvenile mortality. This is because every female, on average, of a species is, is only persisting over evolutionary timescales uh, if she's replacing herself. So we can say the larger your lifetime fecundity is, the mean juvenile mortality rate experienced per capita by your offspring is going to be high. So thinking about a broad, broadcast spawner or even a tree versus you know, a live-bearing snake. The, we can say something about the relationship between lifetime production of offspring and mortality. This is really useful, and I'll show you in a minute why I think so. So our methods, we compiled vertebrate traits. We didn't limit ourselves to just reptiles and sharks. We went across all vertebrates, and we're trying to focus on these three traits, body size, age and maturity, lifetime fecundity. We're interested in, in egg layers versus live bearers, and juvenile habitat. You get things like turtles that lay their eggs on land and go back in the water. That's, that's because they're amniotes, which I'll get to in a second. Um, but we're juvenile habitat. Fortunately, there's a lot of databases that ha a lot of hard work has been put into making these beautiful trait databases, um, including one that I've worked on a lot, Sharkopedia, um, so that we were able to compile this big trait data set. And we also made a super tree of vertebrates. So um, actually, Yosef did it. I, I didn't do it. OK, so just to show you, this is our numbers for body size in each lineage, and I've separated them out in this graph. The brown is live bearers, green is egg layers. I threw up mammals and birds just for completeness, but that there's not a lot of interesting variation there. Obviously, most mammals are live bearers. Most birds, all birds, are egg layers. Um, and then you see in these other clades, you get you know, equal representation, or not equal, but, but significant, substantial representation of both modes of live birth. And you get variation in body sizes. OK. Um, oh, no. Oh, this is OK. My, my dots aren't showing up. I showed, OK. So imagine all of these species, I'm plotting their juvenile mortality. Fortunately, we got the regression lines. <laughs> wow. OK. Well, <laughs> OK, look on BioArchive if you actually want to see this figure. But, um, just imagining there's a cluster of points for all. Here, the, it's juveniles in water are in green, and in brown are juveniles in land, right? So that's basically the amniotes. If we take all of those data points, we probably have a couple thousand um, for each group. Then we see that there's really different relationships with body size. So there's actually a serious constraint on juvenile survival that's viable for a life history on land. That's because of the amniotic egg. You, if you're going to lay your baby on land or have a baby on land, it turns out that there are certain regions of life history space that are no longer accessible to you, which I think we kind of know. It kind of makes sense, right? That's not necessarily a life-changing result, but it is a big deal for sort of the way that life history space is constrained. When I do that for adult mortality, just focus on the top two graphs here first, you kind of see the reverse pattern. We see that the 
land species have much areas where they have much higher adult mortality. That's, that's things that mature really, really fast. You get really fast life cycles. But the, the sort of shocking thing was when we added, now, by the way, these are proxies. Oh, this is, wow, drama. OK, so these, these proxies and these graphs, this was an insight that I sort of read in the old literature and promoted as a postdoc and have sort of been writing you know, my own, I've been, uh, I've been writing my own hype about this for a while. <laughs> Then my postdoc, George, added them together, and we got this beautiful graph here. These lines are on top of each other. Now, granted, there's a lot of points that underlie these regression lines. But we were so stunned by this. And we said, uh, is this a constraint? That it is. It's a constraint. It's, it's because we can't have a Darwinian demon. Here you see this is, you're supposed to be able to see my little demon here. Um, you, can't, you cannot have a large body size if you have really high mortality. Of course, it just isn't feasible. So that's a demographic constraint that constrains the life history space that is accessible to vertebrates. And if this is actually a three-way trade-off, right? There's three traits here. There's my, my y-axis, and then there's the x-axis. If we put juvenile adult mortality and body size in a cubicle graph, we get something that we lovingly call the Dorito. And so it is a surface in 3D space, which is where vertebrate, extant vertebrate species are. Now, Yosef had the idea to define ternary, ternary space, which is a slice of the Dorito. So, and that is a way to understand trade-offs among body size, age of maturity, and lifetime fecundity. And so now I want you to see, I'll use my pointer here, we're taking our same axes. Here we're going from low to high juvenile mortality. Over here is low, small body size, large body size, low mortality, high mortality. We can understand where a species is in the Dorito space. This is a slice. And then we can ask, what are, trans what are the transitions that we see? Now we've got binary traits, uh, aquatic versus terrestrial, egg laying versus live bearing. So we can actually, you can leap onto another slice if you want. OK, so this is how we set up our phylogenetic analysis of trait evolution of all vertebrates in ternary space. So this is, so where we are on our Dorito slices, it reflects where extant species are ba balancing these trade-offs. I'm showing you the boring ones first, right? There's no, right, big drama, no life-bearing birds. Whoops. Oh, no, 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 no. No, no, no. No, no. OK, yeah, so, and you can see in mammals, I've got like four mammals. Those are the echidnas and platypus. So don't pay too much attention to the oviparity triangle on this one. But you see, these are, yeah, mammals and birds actually look pretty similar, despite the fact that, you know, mammals are viviparous. Now, um, here we are for our chondrichthys. And here I'm showing you the tree. Um, and, and if you can squint, Unfortunately, you can see these points. The color of each lineage is, is reflected in the color of the point. I guess you can't really see that. But yeah, what we see here is among egg-laying chondrichthians, they're, they're primarily here in life history space. When they evolve viviparity, they go over here. When we look at, say, reptiles, they do not change as much. So that was, so Yosef did a pretty, Yosef and Nick, did a pretty complex a quantitative analysis to show that this is the case. But really, I think you can kind of see it here. Is this the difference between these two here didn't move herps as much in life history space as we saw in the chondrichthians? You can't see my pointer? Oh, well, well. OK, great. So, what, so this is my last slide. What did we learn? First of all, internal fertilization, guys, we have no theory for that. It's, it has to do with when females, it's advantageous for females to have control over parentage. You evolve internal fertilization. This, this is, topic is totally neglected in evolutionary biology. Uh, number two, demographic constraints are defining the life history traits that's available for vertebrates, and it could, it's especially strong for amniotes. Within that space, 
We found that viviparity tends to slow life histories along the fast flow continuum in aquatic species. There are exceptions in those bony fishes. Um, so this is primarily in the sort of like the, the sharks, rays, and salamanders. So you move towards a slower life history, larger body size. And then uh, if you can't see the bottom, I'm sorry. But terrestrial life bearers have similar demographic rates, whether they're viviparous or ovoviviparous. Thank you so much, and do you have any questions?